Welcome to this deep dive into the driest region of the British Isles, where we're going to explore an area that could easily be mistaken for a desert. Well, obviously that's an exaggeration since we do get the occasional drizzle and, <laughs> and winter rain. But regardless, while the UK is known for its rain, there are pockets of our land that stand out due to the surprisingly low rainfall and almost arid conditions. Today, we're focusing on the enchanting yet stark landscapes of East Anglia, home to the driest areas in the United Kingdom. Prepare to uncover the unique features, ecosystems, and even the myths that surround this British desert. The driest area in the UK is typically found in eastern regions, specifically around East Anglia, with Norfolk and Suffolk often leading the charts. The average annual rainfall here is around 550 millimeters a year, while a national average hovers closer to 895, with some regions over a thousand millimeters a year. This discrepancy is substantial, indicating a significant climatic divide within the United Kingdom. For example, the town of Laken Heath in Suffolk, known for its picturesque landscapes, records an annual rainfall of just 550 millimetres. This is remarkably low compared to other regions in the UK, making Lake and Heath a prime example of how some areas can experience such dry conditions. Meanwhile, cities like London can receive over 600 millimetres of rain annually, showcasing just how distinct East Anglia is in comparison, even though they're not that far apart. And again, this is more similar to places like Madrid, which are more commonly associated with arid, hotter, sunnier climes. To put that into perspective, let's consider the harsh reality of true deserts. The Sahara Desert, for instance, receives an annual average of about 25 millimeters of rain in its driest regions. But the perception of aridity can vary greatly. Even East Anglia's climate, while certainly not on par with the Sahara, it does resemble desert conditions in some respects. It boasts long, dry summers where rain can be scarce. During the summer months, certain parts of East Anglia can go weeks without significant rainfall, leading to dried up fields and parched landscapes. A big thing about the aridity in Southeast England is to do with the wind patterns, and the wind patterns significantly influence the climate of this region. And we need to talk about something called orographic lift. And uh, orographic lift is when the air is forced over hills or mountains or, you know, the areas that are higher than sea level. And uh, this causes it to cool, condense, and uh, this results in precipitation. Southeast England has fewer significant uh, landforms that have this kind of structure. So obviously, it's going to be vastly different compared to Wales and the West Country and the northern part of the country that have these at highlands, uh, mountainous areas. Basically, it means less orographic lift than occurs, which means less rainfall. Uh, and things like this do affect the local climates. Let's take a specific look at the locations in this quote-unquote British desert, with each of its own unique characteristics. Thetford Forest. Despite being a forest, Thetford has an average annual rainfall of around 600 millimetres a year, making it one of the driest forested regions in the UK. This unique ecosystem is home to a variety of wildlife, including deer, birds of prey, and even rare species like the Nasserous bat. I've probably butchered the pronunciation, fellas, but I'm northern. <laughs> the sandy soil in Thetford struggles to retain moisture, leading to a diverse range of plant life that can withstand dry conditions, including pine trees and heathers. This forest offers a surprising blend of lush, greeny and arid landscapes. The Norfolk Broads. While this region is often recognised for its picturesque waterways and rich biodiversity, many areas of the Broads experience a relatively low annual rainfall of around 550mm, particularly during dry summers. Parts of the Broads can become quite low on water, impacting both the wildlife and the delicate ecosystems that thrive here. The extensive wetlands and marshes of the Broads are crucial for various bird species, but when the water levels do drop, these habitats can resemble, well, basically resemble parched marshlands. Dunwich Heath, located in Suffolk. Dunwich Heath averages around 600mm rainfall each year, showcasing sandy soils that struggle to retain moisture. A similar story. This rich area is absolutely full to the brim with biodiversity, featuring a mix of grasslands, heaths, and coastal environments. 
The plants here are quite uniquely adapted to these dry conditions, including heather and gorse, which flourish during the lack, well, because of the lack of moisture. Not only this, a lot of the UK's arid, exotic, and tropical themed plants thrive in this particular location because of the dry and often sunnier conditions throughout the summer months. When we think of the driest regions in the UK, it's essential to consider not only the low annual rainfall, but also the extreme temperatures that rarely, but can occur. East Anglia, particularly, has recorded some of the hottest temperatures in the UK, further emphasising the arid characteristics of the region. One of the highest temperatures recorded in this region was 40.3 degrees Celsius, which is 104.5 degrees Fahrenheit, in Coningsby, Lincolnshire. This was recorded in July 19th, 2022, which was a record-breaking year in particular, actually. This record-setting heat wave, part of a broader pattern effect than much of the UK, demonstrated just how scorching the summers can get in East Anglia. Coningsby is not far from the driest areas, and such extreme temperatures can often lead to prolonged dry spells, contributing to the region's desert-like feel. Okay, so why is this region of the UK so dry? The dryness of East Anglia in particular can be attributed to a combination of geographical, uh, meteorological, and climatic factors that converge to create a unique environment. In other words, it's quite multifaceted. Then the topography. The landscape of East Anglia is predominantly flat, with very few hills and mountains to facilitate orographic rainfall. In hillier regions, like in the west, moist air rises, then cools, leading to precipitation. However, the low-lying topography of East Anglia lacks this elevation needed to encourage this process, allowing drier air to dominate the climate. The soil composition. So the soil in East Anglia is characterised by sandy and chalky compositions, which are less effective at retaining moisture compared to clay-rich soils. Sandier soils allow water to drain really quite quickly, so it leads to a rapid evaporation and less moisture available for the plants there. This drainage can create conditions that resemble those found in arid desert climates, where limited water is what often restricts plant growth. Seasonal weather patterns. East Anglia experiences a continental climate, or as close to a continental climate as you can get in the British Isles. This directly contributes to its dry conditions. During the summer months, high pressure systems often settle over this region rather than the entirety of the UK. This brings clearer skies and minimal rainfall. These high pressure systems can persist for weeks, leading to prolonged dry spells which the surrounding areas may not see, and those areas might get more rainfall due to lower low pressure systems. So there's also a new addition to the story. There's a place called Dungeness in Kent and it's extremely arid and dry. It receives less than 600 millimeters of rain a year, just like parts of East Anglia. It's just more further south, more further southeast. And as I said, the aridity in other places typically encompasses areas with low rainfall and uh, low moisture environments, and Dungeness fits this criteria. It's predominantly made from shingle, um, and it's characterized by this coastal plain of pebbles and shingle, um, it, which further exacerbates the rarely dry conditions. Since shingle does not retain water well, unlike actual organic matter, unlike soil, clay, which is better at absorbing water and keeping moisture for plant growth, when rain does fall, it quickly drains away through this porous layer and it leaves a little moisture behind for the plants. So this rapid drainage creates a naturally dry environment already where water is scarce and not retained long enough to sustain lush vegetation. So this makes the region look extremely arid and there's next to no uh, dense foliar growth. Um, and arid regions are typically characterized by limited plant life. And this place has limited plant life. Dungeness exemplifies this with, as I said, the, the sparse vegetation. The plants that do grow here are extremely adapted to harsh, dry environments, and they have to deal with the massive temperature extremes, which, because it's pebbles, it's shingle, it heats up really quickly during the summer months, and during the night, the temperature drops, exactly like a desert environment. So a lot of the plants here have adapted to desert uh, evolutionary traits, um, which is quite surprising. You've got things like wild thyme, you've got broom here, you've got exotic gardens flourishing here, you have trachycar uh, trachycarpa species, you have phoenix canariensis species, you have all sorts of different succulent types that are growing on this part of the country. And as I said, although this isn't a desert by any true 
definition, it experiences similar temperature ranges in terms of stark contrasts from the day to the night. One of the most distinctive features of Dungeon S is its near total absence of organic matter. The single surface has so little organic matter that there's basically no topsoil and water runoff gets rid of any remaining nutrients that does happen to sit in the porous shingle. In truly arid environments, the rate of evaporation typically exceeds the rate of uh, precipitation. And Dungeon S, again, not by true desert standards by strict measurements often experiences rapid evaporation due to the dry windswept nature of the land and the intense sunlight that beats down on the shingle and while Dungeness may never be considered a desert in the traditional sense its combination of low rainfall fast draining sing shingle sparse vegetation strong drying winds and minimal soil makes it feel like an arid region these factors result in conditions more typical of deserts uh, than lush green landscapes more typically associated with the United Kingdom. So while calling Dungeness in Kent a desert might seem kind of unusual in the context of the UK's typically lush climate, it's not so far-fetched if you think about it, since there's arid environments that are in, well, more northerly latitudes. Uh, one of the striking examples of arid conditions at high latitudes is found in parts of Canada, uh, the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia, despite being at a latitude of around 50 degrees north, is a semi-arid region. Uh, it received very little rainfall, comparable to some deserts, uh, due to its rain shadow effect caused by the surrounding mountain ranges. And even though it experiences severe cold winters, the Okanagan's dry conditions are quite similar to those of an actual desert. And even farther north, the Arctic tundra is also an arid desert despite it being extremely cold the tundra's frozen soil which is a permafrost and low precipitation uh, levels often under 250 millimeters annually classifies it as a desert like environment which is sort of cheating considering it's a cold desert but we can go further east uh, or other high latitude areas that experience arid conditions on a similar latitude to the uk for example in russia you have places in siberia in yakutia um, that experienced very low, very low precipitation uh, alongside an extremely cold winter, but warm summers. And as I said, it's not entirely due to latitude. It can be these multifaceted reasons as to why a region may be considered arid. And because the UK is in mostly a temperate, or if not wholly, in a temperate maritime, maritime climate, when you do get dry areas, um, these pockets of microclimates, then things kind of blur, the lines of climate sort of model up a little bit, and you have overlapping uh, climates in which it's sort of a temperate maritime, but at the same time, quite dry. So it kind of just makes things more interesting, doesn't it? And so that's kind of my point. The United Kingdom is a very northerly latitude country and should experience much harsher winters, but the truth is it doesn't. And it blurs the line of what is a temperate maritime climate and what isn't in some regions. And you could say that's exaggerating. And to a degree, it is. This is a YouTube video. We're supposed to be a kind of form of entertainment. But it's just interesting that you can go from the highs of over a thousand millimeters of rain a year to almost arid conditions in the southeast. And there's not much of a geographical distance between that. So yeah temperate maritime climates very rare one of the rarest climate types there is and it's made a very good topic and an interesting video